Now let's talk about depreciating long-lived tangible assets. As mentioned before, depreciation is the systematic allocation of the assets cost over time. So you buy an asset worth 10 million, this will be used over 10 years, so you can depreciate this value or expense it out over 10 years. Though not a cash expense, but real and significant operating expense. So depreciation is shown as an operating expense. Carrying value is the net value of an asset which equals historical cost minus accumulated depreciation. So you might see the term carrying value of an asset or you might see the term net book value. Uh, you will also see terms like historical cost. This is the gross investment in the asset. So original purchase price including any transportation, installation costs and so on which we have seen earlier. So just to make sure you understand this, let's say that when you purchase the asset, this total cost that you incurred was 10 million. So this would be called the historical cost or the gross amount or the gross investment. So that's 10 million. Let's say that in year one, your depreciation is equal to 1 million. So at the end of year one, your carrying value, which is the same as net book value, is going to be 9 million and the accumulated depreciation is 1 million. At the end of year two, the net book value is going to be, let's say, 8 million, which means that the accumulated depreciation is now 2 million. So notice that the accumulated depreciation plus the net book value will always give you historical cost. So let me just write that down because that's fundamental. So historical cost will always be equal to the net book value, which is the same as carrying value, plus accumulated depreciation. You need to be familiar with three depreciation methods, the straight line method, accelerated depreciation and units of production method for depreciation. So the straight line method is straightforward. Let's just understand these three methods by taking a simple example. Let's say that the, the total gross investment or the amount you spend on a machine initially is 12 million. And let's say that the residual value, this is how much you will sell it for, is 2 million and your expected life for this machine is 5 years. So you set it up, buy it and set it up for 12 million, you'll use it for 5 years and then you expect to uh, get rid of it after 5 years for 2 million. Now how will we depreciate this with the straight line method? In the straight line method, you simply depreciate an equal amount every year. That's why this is called straight line. And the annual depreciation is equal to your initial cost minus the residual value divided by the life. So every year you will depreciate 2 million. And let's create a very simple table here. So what will happen in, let's say in year one, so this is your table and this is the year. So in year one, the beginning net book value. So you start with a beginning net book value of 12 million. Your depreciation expense every year is 2 million. AYED stands for accumulated year end depreciation. So at the end of year one, the accumulated depreciation is 2 and ending year net book value is so you start with a book value initially of 12, you get rid of the depreciation, subtract out the depreciation and your ending book value is 10. So in year 2, you start with a beginning book value of 10. So this 10 simply comes down. The depreciation for the year is again 2. The accumulated depreciation is now 4 and the ending book value is now 8. So do the same for years 3, 4, 5. At the end of year 5 you will notice that the ending book value will be 2 and your accumulated depreciation will be 10. 
as discussed before the sum of these two will always include the, uh, will always be the historical cost or the gross value of the asset accelerated depreciation methods say that you take out more depreciation at the beginning of the asset's life and as you will see later this method is allowed when we do uh, so this method is allowed under tax rules but more on this in the next reading there are several different accelerated depreciation methods the one that you need to be familiar with at level 1 is called the double declining balance method and what we do here is the formula is 2 divided by the life of the machine multiplied by carrying value which is the net book value at the start of the year so let's continue with that same example and see what happens uh, so let's see in year 1 what the depreciation will be in year 1 the depreciation will be 2 divided by the life which is 5 multiplied by the carrying value at the start of the year which is 12 so 2 over 5 into 12 will give you 4.8 so continuing with the table in year 1 our beginning net book value is 12 our depreciation expense is 4.8 and our uh, accumulated year end depreciation is still 4.8 our uh, ending net book value will be 12 minus 4.8 which is 7.2 in year 2 we have a beginning net book value of 7.2 the depreciation expense will now be 2 over 5 multiplied by 7.2 which gives us approximately 2.88 and so on so the de accumulated depreciation will now be 4.8 plus 2.88 and so on and the ending book value will be the beginning book value minus ending book value so we keep doing this until we hit a value of uh, until we get to the uh, to the residual value of 2 so we cannot depreciate below 2 the total accumulated depreciation by the end of year 5 actually in this particular case if you do the numbers you will notice that in year 4 and I want you to to go through this in year 4 the only amount that you will have to depreciate is going to be 0 0.59 so notice that in year 5 the depreciation will be 0 0.59 because that will bring us down to uh, accumulated depreciation of 10 and uh, ending book value of 2 so make sure that you can do this actually this happens in this will happen for you in year 4 so do the numbers and make sure you get it with units of production method we depreciate based on how much you have used the machine so let's say that for this particular machine in year 1 you let's say that this machine will produce 5000 units so this machine will produce 5000 units and in year 1 let's say that you produce 1000 units in year 2 you produce 2000 units year 3 1000 again and then year 4 500 and year 5 five, 500 again so in year 1 you your usage was 1000 over 5000 so you used 20 percent so the depreciation will be 20% of the total amount that you are depreciating which is 10 million and so 20% of 10 million will give you 4 so that's your depreciation for year 1 in year 2 the depreciation will be 40% uh, of 10 so 40% of I'm sorry, so 20% of 10 would have been 2, 40% of 10 would be 4 million, 
and then again 2 million 1 million 1 million so notice that uh, 6 8 10 so over the 5 years the total depreciation here will also be 10 million so make sure you understand these three methods fairly straightforward now what's the impact on financial statements of two companies one uses straight line one uses uh, the accelerated method so notice that at least initially the depreciation expense for the straight line method will be lower whereas if a company is using the accelerated method the depreciation will be higher net income will be higher for straight line because we have uh, the expense is lower so the net income will be higher the assets initially will be higher because we are depreciating less remember this actually is net assets so with net assets if we are initially depreciating less then the net value of the assets will be higher and since assets and equity go hand in hand there is no impact on liabilities so the equity will also be higher the return on assets so net income over assets will initially be higher why is this because the net income in general will be higher and assets will also be higher but in percentage or relative terms the net income for a company using straight line will be much higher relative to the accelerated depreciation company and the assets will only be a little bit higher in percentage terms relative to the accelerated depreciation company hence the return on assets will be higher and similarly the return on equity will also be higher the turnover ratios will be lower for the straight line company and higher for the uh, accelerated depreciation company all these relationships are for the early years of uh, assets life and are reversed in later years of the assets life if the firm's capital expenditures decline component depreciation IFRS requires firms to depreciate components of assets separately so for example if you are uh, talking about a plane then according to IFRS you need to separately depreciate the engine the frame and the interior furnishing of a plane and this is easy to relate to in the sense that if you consider a typical PIA plane the if you speak to a PIA engineer you will realize that on the 747 the engine has been used for decades so let's say that it would not be unreasonable that for a Boeing 747 the engine which is which represents a, a fair amount of the cost is potentially I don't know this for a fact but let's say this is depreciated over 30 years the frame also probably is depreciated over a very long period of time and the way we tend to use our planes the interior furnishing might just last two years so it makes sense for certain assets to actually depreciate components separately and IFRS in fact requires that US GAAP allows component depreciation but does not require it. I think that what I have described here should be good enough uh, preparation for the exam but again if you want to be diligent there is a nice example in the curriculum uh, example 5 to be specific. How do you amortize intangible assets? Intangible assets with finite useful lives are amortized over their useful lives and this essentially amortization process is the same as depreciation process assets without a finite useful life are not amortized but are reviewed for impairment whenever changes in events or circumstances indicate that the carrying amount of an asset may not be recoverable so the point here being that let's say that initially your net assets you bought a company where the net assets had a fair value of 60 and let's say that you paid so the purchase price was 60 so you logged goodwill equal to 
uh, equal to 20. Now one year later, let's say that the net assets are still worth 40 and there has been some negative publicity around your firm. So you now suspect that the overall value of the firm is less than what you paid. So less than the 60 that you paid and you have a survey done or you see how much uh, others are willing to pay for your business and let's say that the amount people are willing to pay now is down to 50. So what does this mean? This means that there has to be some goodwill impairment. So you then impair goodwill which means writing goodwill down from 20 down to 10. So in the year of this impairment you will recognize in your income statement an impairment loss equal to 10 million which obviously is not a cash flow but it reduces your uh, your uh, income for that year revaluation now on previous slides basically what we've talked about is a cost model where you initially log your asset at a certain historical cost and then you recognize this expense over time using depreciation an alternative model which is only allowed by IFRS is called the revaluation model and this for every period restates the asset at fair value so if an asset is going up in value you show it at the new fair value this is only allowed by IFRS if there is an active market for the asset. So if there is an active market then you can unambiguously recognize what the market price is and that gives you a basis for revaluation. Now if you initially bought an asset, if you initially bought an asset at the fair value of 10 million and at the end of the second year for example let's say that the fair value of that asset is 9 million so for that year you now show a loss of 1 million in the income statement subsequently if the value goes up let's say that the value in the third year goes up to 9.5 million you can show this as a gain of 0 0.5 million in your income statement and then in the following year let's say that the value of the asset now goes up to 12 million what you can then do is show a gain in your income statement of 0 0.5 million so that brings you back up so that you have covered the loss but the additional 2 million gain that goes beyond that uh, that initial loss of one the two million will be shown in shareholders equity as a revaluation surplus and revaluation surplus is a subcomponent of other comprehensive income that you have seen earlier in the course now let's talk about impairment in a little more detail first with IFRS and then US GAAP if the carrying value of an asset is greater than recoverable amount then an impairment loss is reported so in principle what does this mean so this means that your net book value which is your carrying value of an asset is say 10 million but the recoverable amount or how much you can get for this asset is only 8 million so here the principle of conservatism suggests that it does not make sense to be showing an asset for 10 million whereas you can only get 8 million for it. So you need to impair the asset which means write it down. So what are the nuances related to IFRS? How much impair impairment loss will you recognize? The impairment loss will be the carrying value which in my simple example is 10 million minus the recoverable amount 8 million so our impairment loss is 2 million the how do you calculate this recoverable amount the recoverable amount is the greater of fair value less cost to sell so this is somewhat an analogous to the net realizable value that you saw in the earlier reading but in any case let's say that the fair value is 8.5 million 
cost to sell is 0.5 million and so your recoverable amount according to IFRS is 8 million so anyway so it's the greater of this fair value less cost to sell and value in use value in use is the present value of cash flow from asset so if the present value of cash flow so this is the net positive cash flow that you expect from this asset in the future so if you find the present value of the future cash flows and you end up with 7.5 million then you use the 8 million if the present value turns up turns out to be more than 8 million then you use the higher number the impairment loss if you recognize an impairment loss they can be reversed so only the loss can be reversed so as long as you come back to the original historical cost that's okay and if the value of the asset keeps going up beyond this you cannot recognize any gains with US gap uh, again a firm might not be able to recover the fair value of an asset so same concept now impairment under US gap involves a two-step process step one is recoverability so asset is impaired if the carrying value is greater than the assets future undiscounted cash flows so this is simply a test if the asset uh, carrying value is 10 million and the future undiscounted cash flows equal 11 million I'm sorry equal 9 million then that means we need to do uh, impairment but this is simply a test it's like a litmus test the impairment loss is then the difference between the fair value which is 10 million and the uh, so between the fair value of the asset and the carrying amount so we calculate that determine that difference and that is logged as our impairment loss US gap is a little more rigid than IFRS and if the value of the asset subsequently goes up the impairment loss cannot be reversed derecognition long-lived assets are eventually either sold exchanged or abandoned the gain or loss on sale of long-lived asset is equal to the sales proceeds minus the carrying value of asset at time of sale gain or loss is reported in the income statement for a subsidiary segment or asset group which can be clearly distinguished the gain or loss is reported as discontinued operations and that's below the continuing operations abandoned assets are treated like a sale with zero proceeds the carrying value is essentially removed from the balance sheet and the loss is recognized in the income statement for a exchanged asset the carrying value is removed from the balance sheet and you record the fair value of the new asset and the difference between these two is shown as a gain or loss and this is computed by comparing the carrying value of the old asset with the fair value of the new asset so if the old asset had a carrying value of 10 million and the new asset has a carrying has a fair value of 9 million you basically recognize a loss of 1 million presentation and disclosures so what are the disclosure requirements under IFRS again th this list is actually longer than what I've shown here but I've tried to take out items that I think are most important and where you are most likely to be tested so you need to clearly state your basis for measurement so if you are reporting value for your land you need to it needs to be disclosed whether you are showing a historical value or whether you are showing market values fair values etc if you are showing equipment it needs to be clearly stated in the footnotes whether you are using the historical cost less accumulated depreciation or whether you are showing market prices and so on so for every major asset you need to indicate the basis of measurement for all your fixed assets you should 
show either the useful life or the depreciation rate you need to show gross carrying values and accumulated depreciation so i'm sure you've seen in balance sheets that for property plant and equipment there will be a gross amount and then accumulated depreciation is subtracted and then you have net pp and e and this is done because it is an ifrs requirement to disclose both the gross amounts as well as net amounts reconciliation of carrying amounts from beginning of period to end of period so you need to see uh, so it needs to be shown how the carrying amounts are changed if any assets are pledged as collateral that needs to be disclosed if companies are using the revaluation model and remember this is only allowed under ifrs then we need to disclose the revaluation date and then how the new fair value was determined and the carrying value using the cost model so had the cost model been used then what would the carrying value have been if any assets have been impaired then we need to show impairment losses and reversals by asset class where are those losses recognized on the income statement or gains if they are gains and the circumstances under which the impairment happened so again i feel that from a disclosure and presentation perspective this is fundamentally what you need to know but if you want you can read this in more detail i am also skipping the us gap disclosures which are mostly similar but there are subtle differences and i really doubt that your examiner is going to test you on us gap or differences most of the ifrs curriculum is now uh, more focused on uh, i'm sorry most of the financial reporting and analysis curriculum is more focused on ifrs now there are some differences between ifrs that uh, and us gap that are very important such as the treatment of uh, interest and so on which i'll keep referring to but in this particular case on disclosures i don't think this difference is that important however if you are being extra diligent from your study notes or from the curriculum you can also read disclosures related to ifrs but as i keep saying it's much more important that you practice so do all the questions practice problems in the curriculum and from your study notes and wherever else you can find practice problems do them because that's when you really learn and understand the material well that's it for now